one, two. Well, this old world's a little out of control. I'm Spinning just some way too fast. Days. Look for a way to get back in touch. A way huh? to make a moment last. Nope. So starting right now, I'm going back to the plow. I got a feeling that I'm not alone. Oh, yeah. We gotta get out. Oh, go yeah. Get a shovel There's a good it's one. Time oh, for us to oh, grow. Oh. We got to grow our own. We gotta make it real. You know, the best things in life are free is a win. And people, that's a pretty good deal. So the next time you feel like that's it's passing you by, don't you sit there and cry. Yeah. Alone. You just roll up your sleeves and throw out some seeds, cause that's how you grow your own. So I went outside and did some digging around, made myself a few little rows. Kicked off my shoes and I dug right in, got the dirt up between my toes. Next thing I knew, I was deep in a dream, and everything around me was growing up green. It was the coolest thing that I'd ever seen, and all I did was grow my own. We get to grow our own, we get to make it real. You just whistle a tune and buddy, pretty soon you'll be knocking back a homemade meal. So the next time you feel like it's passing you by, don't you sit there and cry and moan. You just roll up your sleeves and throw out some seeds, cause that's how you grow your own. Now the sun came peeking through my window this morning, said welcome to a brand new day. I was thinking what a mighty fine gift it was, just perfect in every way. How lucky we are, blessed indeed, to get a world full of joy from a handful of seeds. It's a simple solution to cover our needs when we get out and grow our own. We get to grow our own. We get to make Epic's it real. That's really hard work, but if you're a good, but if you're a prof professional like I am, it's a really it's really easy, but if there's not really much good ones and you're a professional, it's really hard. Where does your food come from? Is it safe? Is it good for you? Your parents' parents never bought oranges grown in Australia. They never bought kiwis from New Zealand blueberries from Chile, or grapes from Africa either. Your parents' parents ate fruit and vegetables that were grown out in the country. They drank milk that came from the local dairy. They ate beef raised no more than a couple hours away. Sixty years ago, food that was abundant was preserved, dried, or canned for later. Where did food, grown locally, disappear to? Where did our butcher go? Where did the dairy go? It's a complicated issue, but I'm here to tell you, the idea of local food is back. The idea of locally based healthy economies is back. Local food tastes better. It's better for you, and it's better for your neighborhood and the planet. Why would you or I go out of our way to buy our food from the farmer that grew it? Well, until you've scrambled up and tasted a fresh egg, or bitten into an exotic tomato, just picked, you'd probably never really know. Going out of your way to find local food begins with taste, but goes much deeper. As deep as the cell tissue in each of our bodies, as deep as the health of our neighborhoods and the world we leave to our children's children. If you choose to grow your own food, or if it just makes sense to buy vegetables from the person who grew them, you'd be called a locavore. It's not a bad thing, in fact, it's starting to be cool. Jessica Prentice invented the word in San Francisco in 2005. Locavore, the word, was then picked as word of the year by Oxford University Press in 2007. Just how far will a locavore go to find fresh food? Well, a hundred miles seems to be about the limit. But your own backyard just makes a lot more sense. You have to understand that this is the future of the entire food system. When you move, to a, when you move into a new area, not only are you going to be looking for who your doctor and your dentist and your lawyer and your bank, but you're also looking for your farmer. Where are you going to get your food? 
If you're only used to eating out of a grocery store, find a farmer and taste something or grow it yourself and taste it because there's a world of difference. When you grow organically and locally, uh, you know the people that are, that are providing the food. They're your neighbors. It's really the way that nature intended us to eat. Um, getting something right out of the field instead of from a styrofoam container. We as a nation have allowed our populations to lose some of the knowledge about how to grow things locally. We've lost the ability to incorporate food growing into our everyday spaces. If we nurtured that capability again, or brought it back and helped train people in it, there's no reason that you can't grow most of your food within a, a reasonable local environment, even in a city. We've lost touch of how much human energy it takes to create a morsel of food. Um, we're eating oil right now, essentially. And we're eating out of trucks. And that's not gonna work for much longer. People are demanding quality and they're demanding to know where their food is coming from. The increasing price of gas is gonna force us, I think in one way or another, to become more locally driven, uh, to find producers or start producing on our own, to go back to the Victory Garden or the, the garden, or everybody has a garden. If more people had gardens, they would be busy doing really important things, growing food for themselves and the planet. And yeah, I think it would be a better world. The work that has to be done is in, in our communities and, and we need to relocalize all of our life, all aspects of our life again. And there's a movement in this country and in Europe and other industrial countries, they're beginning to recognize how important it is to bring everything home again. You know, we outsourced our lives, our jobs, and our food and everything. It's time to bring it home. And we're gonna get local. We have to. Nature's local. Uh, nature's economy is gonna force us to really rediscover, and it's not a bummer, rediscover our home places and uh, the beauty and the bounty that we really can have locally. Your health is who you are and what you can accomplish. It's your personality, your smile. It's your positive outlook when you wake up in the morning. It's your peace of mind when you sleep at night. We truly are what we eat, and what we eat becomes who we are. What you choose to put in your body is the single most important decision you can make for yourself. Food and health, both physical and mental, are so closely related we can't talk about one and not the other. How and where food is grown is every bit as important as who your doctor is. In many instances, it's your farmer and your produce manager that have more to do with your health than your doctor. This begs the question, who's your farmer? Taste is one of the five senses that can lead us toward a healthy body. Taste helps us to decide what we want to eat, and this is especially true when it comes to our children's eating habits. Real, locally grown food has a taste unlike anything that can be brought in by boat and truck. The sensitivity of human taste buds are truly amazing. Developed tastes can distinguish between subtle differences, say, of where a grape is grown, or if the soil where your beets grew up was alive or dead. Organic soil is full of life with millions of microorganisms bringing nutrients to plant roots. Once treated to the tastes of fresh local food, your taste buds won't let you go back to overprocessed, overshipped, and overfertilized foods very easily. To eat a ripe piece of fruit or to eat a tomato that's actually ripened in your garden 
tastes completely different than anything you'll ever pick out of a store. So you should find those farmers locally that can provide you with fresh, ripe food. So why do local but, uh, foods taste so much better than the typical foods you find in the grocery store? After you start eating real eggs and real food from real people locally, I mean, you'll just notice a difference. It's, it's and that's, you know, a lot of this, the, the stuff in grocery stores just isn't, it isn't really food. It's just sort of shaped like food, you know, so. <laughs> Flavor is an indicator of the nutrition available in food. Flavor can tell you how healthy the soil was that actually grew your food. The thing that sells our food more than anything is flavor. People come and say, you know, we have older folks come and buy our food and they go, this is how beef used to taste, you know. This is how meat used to taste. Uh, these eggs remind me of when I was a little girl, you know, stuff like that. Folks from, say, South America and other countries that still are in touch with that and have more localized systems still, they, they come and buy our food too because it tastes like home. It tastes, they, they know the difference. Flavor is a very interesting thing about, uh, to talk about too, because if food doesn't have flavor, then it's lacking in all the trace minerals and all the things that trigger full, the full sugars and all the flavors in food. If it's not in the soil, if we continue to degrade soil with pesticides, herbicides, and monocropping, and, and soil erosion, and all the things we're doing to it, um, we're killing off the life in the soil that actually harvests all those micronutrients and all the mineral, trace minerals, out of the ground that can put it in your food. And so we've turned the soil into a dead medium, just jacked up on nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And so flavor is an indicator of health. Fresh, crisp, nutritious, and extremely flavorful food are all a part of the locavore's diet. Even kids will devour vegetables, so long as they reach full flavor and are sweetened naturally in the ground or on the vine. I have to tell the story of my two grandchildren who were seven and nine and went to a day camp at uh, Cure Organic Farm in Boulder for four days and I, they stayed with me. And I picked them up the first day and said, what was the best part of your day? And both of them got big eyes and big smiles and they said, turnips, grandma. And I said, turnips? And they said, oh, we just pulled them out of the ground, we washed them off and we ate them, just like that. And I said, really? They didn't even get cooked? No, oh, they were fabulous, let's go buy some. Eating locally, you'll discover not only how naturally good local food tastes, but how fresh it is. No need for salt, no need for ketchup. I think that's a huge part of it, just talking to people who have eaten it, and they'll, they'll come up and they go, did you know, they, they educate you too, did you know that your lettuce stays in the refrigerator at least three to four times longer than any lettuce I've ever bought in my life? And why is that? And you go, I don't know. Maybe it's because I picked it the day before I sold it to you or the day that I sold it to you. Maybe it's because it's the way it's grown. Fresh is good. Ultimate right out of the ground with the mud still on it is even better. So the availability of foods that are grown locally, very minimal amount of transport and storage time, and then being consumed is just plain a better product in terms of the nutrient content as well as... as the flavor. Yeah. And that's really probably Seriously. the biggest <laughs> advantage of local foods is that anybody who's had farm fresh produce, gone to the farmer's market and picked up their, their food or grow it in their own garden, there's just no comparison of the flavor and the aesthetic enjoyment of eating those foods. And one of the best things you can do for your health is increase the amount of produce that you eat. And the best way to do that is have it taste so good that you want to eat a lot of it. <laughs> By moving more locally um, with all of our foods, we don't feel deprived at all. We actually feel blessed. We cannot go to a grocery store and buy most of their produce now because we just expect so much better 
because our locally produced foods are, are a quantum leap in quality better. And you, you can't go back. It's, I really feel bad for the rest of the world that's eating this because it's junk. A, a tomato from a grocery store that tastes like styrofoam after you eat real ones. And we're not going back. <laughs> we're just not. <laughs> Freshness of food, that expectation is back. And that's because they've, people have tasted the quality that you only get of true tree ripe fruit or garden fresh vegetables. And once that cat's out of the bag, you cannot stuff it back in easily. Local foods top the charts for flavor and freshness, but they do more than just taste good. High quality, locally grown food can really make a big difference in your day. When we have energy, enthusiasm, and are excited to get up in the morning, then life is the way it should be. Mm. With a diet of whole, vine-ripened, or pasture-raised foods, we have vitality that keeps us going strong all day. I feel wonderful. I, I feel incredible. I tell people that I feel better now I'm nearing 50 years old, and I feel better now than when I was in my 20s. I feel like getting up in the morning and going jogging, you know, or doing yoga, or taking hikes up in the mountains, and playing with my children. I have lots of energy to do that, and physically, I feel really healthy. This lady comes up to me at the market, and she kept staring at me, she kept looking at me. She goes, I said, can I help you? And she goes, she kept looking, she goes, I want to eat what you're eating. I want to have the energy. I want to have the smile that you have. I want to have the lust that you have. Or I want to have the color that you, that's in your face and my face. And I, said, I got just, just what you need. <laughs> it makes you just feel, I think, healthy too. I think your body feels, your body kind of thanks you. It rewards you by when you ask something of it, it's like, yeah, sure, what do you want me to do? Also, I think a lot of people are, are searching for the, the fountain of youth and they, they, don't, they don't feel well and they're sick and they hurt. And, you know, the companies are very anxious to sell them supplements and vitamins. And my answer to that is, you know, eat real food. What we eat is the building block of every cell in our body. In order to function properly, we need good nutrition, which starts with high quality food. I'm going to do to find out, and the only way they can is to start. Just get the food, get the fresh food right off the farm, take it home, get the family eating it, and it just, it, the, it's easy because you can, a kid will do it naturally. They go, wow, this, uh, this tomato is great, this lettuce just, why, this doesn't taste like the other stuff I was eating. The food on the shelf, can you leave it there too long, and there's, markets it just gets bitter and it's ooh they have to start doing things to it to try to make the kids eat it you give them fresh food boy you don't have to try to do anything they'll just go right for it that level of health and the whole nation will go up yeah what an option i think the, first of all food loses its quality the longer it's been picked and on the road and by quality i mean nutrition and taste there's a number of reasons why obtaining the food locally is very good for the overall health. Uh, one, of course, has to do with the fact that the quality of produce available, grown and delivered in a very short period of time, uh, really enhances the nutrient value of the foods in that time in storing of the foods and transporting the foods reduces the availability of the antioxidants, which is one of the best uh, nutrient values that's available in produce foods. If you can find the foods with the most nutrients per calorie, those are the ones that are going to make us the healthiest, right? You can eat like the croissants I talked about would have loads of calories in, but not a lot of nutrients. And so we went more to the nutrient-dense foods. I had a daughter who was three years old that I was told had asthma. And we started talking about it and decided that we probably never learned fully how to eat. Even though both of us had spent time in an RN program, so we had classes in nutrition. 
but we didn't feel like we really were comfortable knowing what foods we should feed our families, what foods we should be eating ourselves. We ate a lot of rich foods, and so we started reading books and studying nutrition, and that was the start to my passion going toward food. And I learned that people don't eat enough fresh fruits and vegetables. That was the bottom line. And that little girl that I had that had asthma, within two months of changing our diet, she had no asthma and she doesn't have asthma now. In 17 years, we've never had a medicine that the kids have taken, no antibiotics. You know, for four kids and seeing our family physician when I was changing the way I ate, he said, you know, I never took a nutrition class. He said, but what I do know is your kids aren't in here for strep throats and ear infections and things like that. And so there's never been even a painkiller, you know, that's been necessary for the last 17 years in this family. It's priceless. Think about all the kids that are going around eating junk food and they're all screwed up. You know, they can't even pay attention in class. They can't hold their concentration for just seconds. You take them off of sugar, you get them on fresh, whole, vital plant foods, they transform in front of you almost. In minutes, they'll change. For thousands of years, the human diet was whole, organic food. But in the last 60 years, our kitchen tables have been stacked with highly processed, genetically modified, mass-produced food components, deconstructed and stripped, then reanimated for human ingestion. Me, personally, I don't think our bodies evolved quite as quickly as our food did, and I don't think we were really meant to eat things in those types of states. Uh, and I think people are starting to find that out, that they don't feel very well. And uh, the American diet, uh, people are not very healthy. We are the richest country, we have the greatest food supply, and we're some of the unhealthiest people in the world. Um, you know, why is that? And I don't really think I want to be a guinea pig. Poland said it too in his, his book that you cannot take food and dissect it into its elements and expect them to be all that the whole food is. Becoming conscious of where your food comes from and how it has been handled or altered before you acquire it is the first step to becoming a locavore. I've been a locavore, well, we probably really started in 1999. Um, I read an article on how they hydrogenate foods and it was a very scary thing. Um, the, the nexus of it, it was that they, they can immerse stuff in petroleum projects to hydrogenate and with that, we cut that out and then became more aware of our food. And as we started reading labels and paying attention, we naturally went straight to being a local for. Once you start reading ingredient labels and think about where your food comes from, a shift will occur. The transition to healthy local foods will open up a whole new world. You think about that for a minute and you realize, God, that could be me. I can be, I can be healthier, I could be more excited about life. I can be happier. Ooh, it's, uh, it's really a worthwhile transition. Transitioning your diet to fresh, nutrient-rich local foods will provide the fuel, energy, and vitality. It's like, I call it the Ferrari theory. If you buy a Ferrari and it's beautiful and it's shiny and you love that car, you take really good care of it. You change the oil, you polish it up, you put really good quality of gas on it. So your body is like a Ferrari, so why do you treat it so badly? You know, you want the best fuel you can that makes it run well and feel good and look good. And only by eating real food, I think, can you do that. Is your food safe to eat? Do you know who grew the lettuce and spinach in that salad? In the bright and clean aisles of the grocery store, do you even need to ask these questions? Now more than ever, food contamination is a safety issue. The average vegetable now travels more than 1,500 miles from field to table. What happened to this innocent cucumber on this monumental journey? What are the food safety standards in the far-off country where it was grown, picked, 
washed and packed. When you don't know where your food comes from, what it was fertilized with, what pesticides were used, who was handling it, and how it was stored, you are at risk. When you buy locally, you can understand where your food comes from and you can trace it if there's ever an issue. You buy something in the store, forget it. You don't know where it comes from. Listen, I would trust local foods better than anything that came from somewhere else. First of all, you look the person in the eye that grew it and they would eat it too. You know, they're not just growing it for you, they're growing it for themselves and they're not going to put anything in their body that they wouldn't eat. And when you buy it, you're buying it directly from them. It hasn't been handled or touched from, for anybody else. Um, a lot of the big agribusinesses don't do the quality control. They can't. They can't possibly do that kind of quality control. Um, they hire all these employees and you can't tell if they've washed their hands. I mean, you know, there's just so many variables that you cut out when you buy local food. Food safety is a big concern of everybody. And one of the issues with food safety concerns contamination of meat. In many animal species, particularly ruminants, when you change what they're eating, you change the population of bacteria in the gut. Grain feeding tends to produce acidified guts. Acidified guts produce bacteria that can survive in the high acid environment. Humans are omnivores, so we have a high acid environment stomach. So when you feed ruminants feeds that make their stomachs high acid or their rumens high acid, then you end up developing in those rumens and in those animals a population of bacteria that can thrive in the same environment that you have yourself. And that tends to mean that if that meat gets contaminated with that bacteria, when you eat it, it's going to infect you because those bacteria survive. The whole reason high acid stomach contents developed in omnivores is so that they could deal with the normal bacteria that ruminants and other plant-eating animals produce because when they ate the meat, even if it got contaminated, it wouldn't survive in their stomachs, they wouldn't get sick. So in general, a pastured ruminant is going to be much safer to eat than one that has been fed lots of grain. We are going to have to take our food supply out of the hands of the corporate America um, because it's not working. They're not working. Uh, they're not working for us. They're not working for the, the health of our society or for the health of us as a people. In order to be able to have a healthy food source, um, we are needing to look elsewhere and elsewhere is right in our own backyard locally and organically and when we understand that we are going to understand that we have the power to take that away from the industrial agriculturalist and corporate America and bring that back to our own communities and as soon as you start paying attention to your eating if you're all at all aware you start seeing wow this this really doesn't make much sense and then, then the, option, the logical option is to go local. How much is food worth? Value can go deeper than just cost versus quantity, like the value of a healthy body or the value of a vibrant neighborhood. For food grown locally, the money you spend not only buys the best meal in town, it goes to shape your community, your open spaces, it affects your taxes, and even your drinking water. A dollar spent locally can literally shape the world around you. The price of local food can vary from virtually free, like the veggies you grow in your backyard, or your neighbor's overabundant zucchini crop, to high-end, freshly prepared gourmet meals from the bistro uptown. Food produced locally is whole or minimally processed, which not only means it's the most nutritious, but the most economical. If you eat healthier, you'll spend less time and money on doctor visits and medication. I think that the consumer needs to know that when you, when you eat this food, there's, it may cost a little more, but when I say value, it's like the nutrition's there so you don't have to eat as much. You'll find 
that you don't eat as much because you're fulfilled. Your body is nourished. You don't need any more. You don't crave for any more. There are also long-term savings that you can receive from eating nutrient-packed local foods, not only on a personal level, but also as a community. So it's not that it's necessarily going to cost you less, at least in terms of your food. It might cost you less long-term because you may not have health issues related to foods that are grown in, in ways that wouldn't be appropriate locally. As the soil quality goes down, your taxes go up. Do you understand that concept? Because as the soil quality goes down, there's less nutrition in the food. And as that goes down, there's more cases of uh, mental disease as well as physical disease that we are pouring money into the um, social system as well as the uh, health system to remedy when all you have to do is create better soil, create better food. And another advantage of buying from your local farmer is we, economists call it the, the multiplier effect. And that's the number of times a dollar circulates in the community before it leaves the community. So when I go to the grocery store, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of my dollar stays in the local community. The rest leaves because it has to pay the truckers, it has to pay the agribusiness giants and the warehouses over in Denver or where the remote warehouses. The money leaves the community. And if I spend the money with my local farmer, that guy, he pays his local property taxes, pays his school taxes, his kids go to the school. He goes down and spends the money at the local feed store, the local hardware store. He spends the money here in the community. It doesn't leave the community. And depending on who you talk with, that multiplier effect for agriculture in an agricultural community is five or six. That means it's, you're, it's five times as effective as if you go to the supermarket and the money leaves the community. So it's really economic development. The multiplier effect inevitably leads to an increase to the trickle-down effect. The more local business and food producers earn, the more money they have to potentially contribute to local churches, charities, and service groups. Money spent locally affects the people that help keep your community alive and thriving. When I eat local foods, first of all, I feel a part of a community. And I think it's really good to support that community. Um, I would rather put some local person's kids through college, then buy another home for some CEO somewhere that I don't know. Um, and also when I can look someone in the face and make a connection with that person, become friends with that person, and learn from them, you know, it's more than just food. It's pretty much a way of life. Supporting your neighbors creates a strong, resilient economic system. A crashing stock market cannot affect fruit growing in an orchard or vegetables in a field. Eating locally can help to preserve the American way of life. You know, eating locally is probably one of the most patriotic acts we can do daily. Um, I think it's Wendell Berry who says eating is a political act. And um, let's look at that for a second. I mean, how, how is it eating locally political? Well, if Every time we spend a dollar on food, it's a vote. By buying locally, we are voting for our local community. We're voting for the preservation of the op our open space. We're protecting a farm, we're, we're keeping a farmer in business. And that's somebody that we have a direct dialogue, we can have a direct dialogue with when we buy their product. We can also have an influence on them. By buying food locally, and you're voting for you're the re, uh, building a resilient local model 
And if that's healthy, and we do that all over the country, we actually build a healthy country. We have to make our communities healthy and resilient. And the only way to do that is to support the local agricultural infrastructure, to support local farmers, to support the butcher, the local grocer, you know, the co-ops, things like that. And if you start with food, uh, food can be produced. It's one of the few things in the local economy that can be produced totally with uh, uh, local raw materials, with local labor. And there's not a whole lot of things you can you, that you can say that about in local economy. It's pretty hard to make a, a local car or something like that. But you can definitely produce a local chicken or a local tomato. This is not an all or nothing proposition. For people who want to change their buying behavior, anything you do that moves you towards buying more local, locally produced food and products in general is a positive thing. So the message isn't, you know, oh, you got to go out and buy 100% of your food. I think it's great when people do that. I think this 100 mile diet thing is pretty interesting. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who just want to understand what they're doing in a little more detail and understand who's doing what on the landscape near where they live. And for people like that, you know, if you went and, and shifted 10% of your buying dollars from the supermarket to the local farmer, you would make a huge difference. I mean, if everybody did that, it would make a huge difference. When you embrace the local food system, you can make another huge difference. Local food purchases are keeping America's small family farms alive. Eating locally helps farmers stay farming. It's important because buying locally helps keep the money in small rural economies that need it to stay viable and keep farmers farming. Uh, purchasing locally helps keep small towns small. Farmers don't want to get out of farming, but if they can't afford to stay in farming, obviously they will sell. The U.S. government took the tactic that we needed to produce cheap food. And there are lots of ways to do that. One of the ways they did that was globalization. Globalization can help or it can hurt. What it did do for sure is push a lot of lucrative farm businesses into areas where labor costs are cheaper. And as a result, we are bringing in or importing more food um, now that we consume, we export a lot of food products that are considered ingredients. So most of the corn grown is not corn that humans can eat, and even oftentimes not that animals can eat. It's a raw material for an industrial process. So, um, you know, I think that we certainly in the next several hundred years are going to have a significant problem with food production in this country if we don't start turning things around. It's really a place-based and community-based um, idea that um, begins to reorganize how we think about the global community and is the beginning point for something that we call globalization. Globalization is about building those local living economies in place, in bioregions, in communities, and then being able to see a web of local living economies on a global scale, it's a way to think about an ecological approach to economy. Um, so that we have the idea that we're locally grounded with our economics um, and we are in just and equitable relationships with other local living economies around the planet. So just as a biosphere um, feeds and sustains the whole planet, a web of local living economies or globalized economies would help maintain and sustain a vibrant planet. So what type of investments are needed locally? Well, first off, each community needs infrastructure, a grain mill, a cannery, a local butcher, small dairy facilities and local distribution systems. America needs small sustainable farming schools for the youth of our country who want to become small local sustainable farmers themselves. Sustainable farming knowledge must get passed down to the next generation. The health and well-being of future Americans depends on it. Over the past 60 years, 
the rules for growing and selling food have changed. While food safety must remain a priority, food policies decided in Washington must be altered. The rules for growing, processing, and distributing foods exist for and were created for the benefit of large agribusiness corporations. Most of these regulations make it cost prohibitive for small farmers to legally sell local food in your corner supermarket or set up a dairy on the outskirts of your town. Agriculture and the way we process food has an undeniable impact on the quality of soil, water, and air on our planet. The gentlest, most earth-friendly food production is small-scale, local, organic farming. Where and ultimately who we decide to buy food from determines the quality of life in our own backyards. It's important to understand we've made some not-so-smart land use decisions. We've made some careless decisions about our water. We've made some very um, profit-driven decisions about our food system. Um, we, um, for those of you that know Michael Pollan's work, uh, you begin to realize that we're eating a lot of food-like substances and not the real thing anymore. So it's time to revisit this very basic ecological relationship that we all have with this good planet Earth, and there's nothing more basic than food and water. The small-scale farmer has little in the way of resources and no subsidies from the government. They sink or swim on their own. These stewards of the soil must take extra good care of their land and water because their livelihood and survival depends on it. In small-scale food production, Everybody knows what's going on. It's possible when you're a small farmer to know what's going on in your fields and to care about it. And if you have an ongoing relationship with the land, you're going to, most small farmers are pretty invested in being sure that their land is well taken care of, even if they're not doing organic farming. And of course, most small scale farmers do do organic and biodynamic farming. So it starts, it really starts from the ground up in quite a literal sense. Humans have successively farmed organically for thousands of years. Only recently, abundant and cheap petroleum and fertilizer have enabled extremely large scale farming operations and in turn, a human population explosion. Organic small scale agriculture helps keep nature in balance. More and more farmers are embracing organics because once established, organically farmed land requires much less time, effort, and money to grow higher yield, higher quality crops. Organic farming employs microscopic living organisms known as microbes. Microbes live in the soil and naturally feed plants as well as other beneficial insects and invertebrates. Done correctly, this creates a rich and fertile soil that does not require additional fertilizers or pesticides. As fossil fuel supplies dwindle and the cost of fertilizers and pesticides increase, more and more farms, even on a larger scale, are switching to organic farming. Organic is more sustainable because it concentrates on the health of the soil rather than just production. To give you the other position, conventional agriculture adds uh, chemical synthetic fertilizers and bypasses the living soil in order to produce. They just feed the plants directly. Whereas organic agriculture, if you follow the, the tenets of it, you add green manures and animal manures and you f actually feed the soil and the microbes in the soil convert that organic matter to the mineral nutrients that the plants need. So as the saying goes, you feed the soil to feed the plants. Knowing that small-scale organic farming is the best choice for our environment, the big question becomes, can we feed our nation from small-scale farms? Because the cities are spreading so fast and just eating up all the prime farmland, can, can we actually feed all the cities with the farmland we have? Because most of it's being used for corn and soybeans and to grow gasoline yeah, sure and can. can we go back the other way far enough to be able to feed the millions of people in the cities as the cities expand beyond our control and take up all the farmland that's a good question good point of discussion 
Uh, it's possible we can do it. Uh, some researchers have done the work and uh, found that we can go all organic and still feed all the people technically with the land we have. But to actually do it may take several decades to switch, change systems from uh, producing corn for uh, soda pop to producing fruits and vegetables for uh, human consumption. Um, if you care about the environment and you want to have agriculture land and open space available, then you need to eat the products that are produced on that space or it's going to go away. Another really great thing about eating locally is you have less packaging and less garbage because things aren't boxed or bagged. That's a great thing. Um, we also get our own milk from people, so we have, don't have any plastic milk cartons. Um, by canning and freezing a lot of our stuff, we recycle all our glass. We have very, very little that goes into the landfill. They say variety is the spice of life, but it's also the key to a healthy ecosystem. 7,500 different varieties of tomatoes are available for you to grow in your own backyard. How many can you find at your local grocery chain? Each variety has its own unique color, shape, flavor, and texture, and as well is adapted to a variety of growing conditions. Variety exists in nature because of genetic changes from generation to generation. These variations ensure survival of the species. Saving seeds ensures food security in your local area. As each farmer year after year saves a seed, new generations will adapt to specific conditions of each locale. If the farmer keeps selecting the seed from the very best plants, a new variety is sown that thrives better in the same growing conditions than previous generations. A unique life form specific to a place. A life form that may very well be the savior of its species. It's real important as a safeguard against certain diseases. If we have a diverse, uh, for example, a diverse squash population where we have zucchini squash from one side of the country to the other, but they're a little bit different because they've adapted over the years to different areas. If one disease wipes out a squash uh, variety in one area, it, there's a uh, likelihood that it won't wipe out the, all the zucchini in the whole country. Where if we all had one single seed base, that's very likely. As in the, a good example is the Irish potato famine. Where everybody's growing the same potatoes that came from the same place for years and years without rotating. And then uh, late blight, which is uh, a disease of potatoes, basically took out all the potatoes in Ireland in one year or two years of crops. And that's possible if you don't have diversity of seed and diversity of crops. Because many foods are literally engineered for storage and shipability, local farmers can grow many varieties of crops that large industrial farms can't grow. As small farms continue this practice over time, yields become abundant and easier to manage. Local farmers love to wow their customers with unique and unusual varieties, sometimes never before seen. Genetic diversity once lost can never be regained. We got the genetic diversity that we have now through thousands of years of human manipulation of the mating systems or what, pro what plants got selected to produce the seeds. Any time you narrow that, you limit your choices. And I think moving forward, we need to have more choices, not fewer, in how we perform agriculture. As small farms disappear, so too does local diversity. It's just as important to protect our agricultural diversity as our wildlife. Large industrial farms typically raise only one or two varieties of animals, the ones that will bring them the most profit. Small-scale farmers raising heritage breeds preserve diversity. Current definition of a heritage breed is one that does not exist in large numbers. They're typically rare. The reason they're rare is they oftentimes do not conform to the current modern industrial form of agriculture. The reason it's important to maintain heritage breeds is that they contain generations of farmers fine-tuning the animals to their environment and we don't know what we're going to need 
And as we move into new environments, like the United States, with this sort of agriculture, because a couple hundred years means we're basically new at it, we might need access to some of those breeds that developed four or 5,000 years ago. I think the locavore movement is critical for maintenance of rare breeds because it's only when you eat something locally you need that thing to grow and thrive locally. That means you're going to need the variety because our environments are different. Genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, are seed varieties that are controlled and developed, sometimes even patented, by industrial food producers. GMOs were developed because it was a way to manipulate agriculture and, and plants and to get us to eat more. See, we're all carrying around roughly a 40 ounce cavity here that get, needs to get filled periodically, right? And there's only so many of us, and so that's the limit to the market. So what they've done with genetically modified organisms and, and Archer Daniels Midlands and Bunge and all these other companies is taken corn, soy, and canola and other things and figured out how to extract different food additives out of them to add them into 90% of what's in the grocery store that you don't need to eat to get to make more profit. And genetically, the, the genetic modification of food, plants, is purely about control of the food system and profit. As a farmer, I can buy that seed one time. I can grow it out. I have a contract. I can't ever, uh, it, when, it, when that corn comes up and it produces more seed, I can't use that seed. I have to buy again. Thousands of generations of people all over the world pass seed on generation after generation, selected, created all the great heirloom varieties that were specific to microclimates and place and culture, cultural priorities. And what we're doing is wiping that out with genetically modified organisms. We're planting one kind of corn. GMOs are agnostic as a technology. They are neither good nor bad. Like any other technology, they can be used in ways that are inappropriate or used in ways that are appropriate. One of the disadvantages of GMOs is, as generally thought, is that when you introduce genes from a different species into a food crop, particularly a plant food crop. That plant will have root hairs that contain those genes that stay in the soil when the plant is died or dies or is harvested. Those genes can then be picked up by soil bacteria and could be incorporated into other plants. So the concern is that genes that you've inserted from a species totally unrelated suddenly get loose in an environment where you didn't expect them and cause unintended consequences. Small, local, diversified farms, growing and caring for plants and animals generation after generation, hold the key to our survival on this planet. When the farms go, so too does the priceless knowledge, handed down from generation to generation. Without the basic knowledge to grow healthy, naturally grown food, how can we survive as a species? The seeds and the earth go together as the beginning of life and we're screwing with it, and that's, that's a no-no. Yep. So uh, 12 and 15 total. Americans spend less money on food and petroleum than anywhere else on the planet. Efficiency on the modern farm has been achieved in large part due to motorized farm implements, petroleum-based fertilizers, and the overall low price of fossil fuels that power the mechanized farm. What would happen if the price of oil doubled as it recently did, or tripled as experts predict? Will the modern mega farm still produce cheap food? Will the oranges that get shipped to our grocery aisles from Australia cost 99 cents a pound when the price of gas reaches $5 a gallon? So we're living high on the hog. You know, if you're 22 years old right now, uh, and this is 2008, uh, you have lived while we have gone through 56% of all the oil that this earth has ever held. 
And that ought to shake you up a little bit, you know. And everything we do is based on that, based on oil. So you turn that spigot off or you start to tighten it up and it gets a little more expensive. According to the Association for the Study of Peak Oil and Gas, the world supply of oil and natural gas will peak around 2010. Our industrial agriculture systems are based on cheap oil. As oil becomes scarce and prices increase, so too will the price of food. Bringing our food system back home as close as possible to where we live and growing that food naturally is the best way to ensure that our supply of food is not dictated by the flow of petroleum. Oil and our ability to find it and harness it in particular, and coal as well, fossil energy, has allowed us to wander. And uh, there's been a lot of issues and a lot of problems because of it. Uh, we're shipping food in from across the world uh, to our plates. Uh, you know, the, the numbers around here, about 1,200 to 1,500 miles is the average uh, distance, farm to fork, that you, if you look at your plate at dinner and, and really figure out where it came from, uh, this is absurd. If you can grow something locally, organically, it, you're way ahead than shipping something in from halfway across the country, that even though that something might be organic, by the time you add to the carbon footprint and the shipping and, and everything to it, uh, it really has canceled out the, the benefits of it being organic, ecologically big picture wise. When you think about where your food comes from or the distance your food comes from, the closer you can buy it to home, the less petrochemicals are used to transport your food to your table. Um, it's kind of nice to know that you in your own little way can do something really exciting every day that you might not know that you're doing to make things healthier for everybody. Very sweet. And you really get uh, bigger every year too. You have more yes, stuff. Exactly. It was a trip to China that woke us up and we came back from that seeing a fifth of the world's population really not wanting to ride bikes anymore and we started doing the math and uh, we noticed that if all of the Chinese people, just the Chinese people, decided they wanted to live like us, you know, and have blue jeans and drive Jeeps around and, and eat food from all over the world, have that right at their doorstep in their grocery store, that we'd probably need four to six extra planets. Increasingly, human activity is impacting vital ecosystems. Left unchecked, our habits and desires will eventually eliminate any chances of increasing the quality of life for all living things on planet Earth. People have it in their head that um, the way we're eating and the way we have been eating for decades now is suitable, that it's something that's acceptable and there's nothing wrong with it. And we're finding out that there are a lot of things wrong with it. It's, it's not conducive to our environment, it's not conducive to our health, uh, and it's, it's creating a system that is very rapidly deteriorating and will disappear if something doesn't change. Interesting place we're in right now is if we take advantage of the fossil energy that we have and use it wisely to build local sustainable systems, we're going to be a hell of a lot better off than if we just continue to ride this fantasy out until we don't have the resources anymore to develop strong local communities. dig for the really good ones. So far, we've tried to show you that eating locally is the right thing to do. Nope. Now it's time to act. Here's where we show you some things that you can do. Many paths lead to local food and local healthy economies. Whatever works for you personally is the right one. Nope. Remember that every effort, big or small, counts. More important is making the commitment. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there's a good one. 
the local movement and organic movement is, is not a quick fix. It is the real deal. And it's been the real deal throughout history. Uh, it's not something that's new. It's been around for thousands of years. And um, people have been utilizing the land and growing sustainably um, way before industrial agriculture came around. And uh, it's time that we get back to that. Some of the work that needs to be done is, uh, is rebuilding resilient communities. And the way we're going to do that is through reestablishing that personal connection to where our food comes from and or at least knowing our farmers. I mean, even choosing our farmers like we choose a, a physician, right? That careful. Step one is to educate both yourself and your community about the impacts eating locally can have. Share the information you've learned so far in this film. Spread the word. Eating food produced close to home can have an impact on the entire world. So the first thing is education. Here's how easy it is. Here's how inexpensive it is. Here's how tasty it is. Here's how satisfying it is. I think the most important suggestions that I would offer someone that wanted to be a locavore is to just start slowly. Go to the grocery store, pay attention to where your food comes from. It, it is labeled mostly now, and if not, ask. Targeting your food is an organized method for keeping track of food origins. First, look for and grow whatever you can in your backyard or windowsill. If you can't find it there, then move out a ring. Look for that food in your community. Check out the local grocery stores, health food stores, farm markets, CSAs, and local restaurants. Don't see it? Demand it from the rooftops. If you really need something and can't find a reasonable substitute, then broaden your search further. Keep in mind, though, that you can support local sustainable farming in far-off places, too. Maybe it's a small batch olive oil made by a family in Italy. Maybe an organic and fair trade chocolate from Honduras. Do your research and read labels. By targeting food, you will find that you can approach 80 to 90 percent of the food you need within your state or closer. And remember, preserving food for later is an important part of the process. If I were going to offer some suggestions for somebody who's thinking about this as an idea, um, I think what we did in our awareness um, really made sense. Start reading the ingredients on the food that you're eating. <laughs> and if you can't pronounce them and they have lots of different carbon kind of names in the middle of them, they may not be really good for you. Know your food. Know where it comes from. Know what goes into it. Know how to cook it. Know how much it costs. How much it really costs to produce. Not just how much it's being sold for at the grocery store. And then use it wisely. Don't waste it. Step two is to make the commitment. Set a goal, one that challenges but does not overwhelm. Try getting a few friends and neighbors to try the local boy lifestyle with you. Late spring, summer, or fall is a great time of year to start a local diet. Start slowly. How about a meal a week? If everyone did just one meal a week, the United States could save over one million barrels of oil per week. So a commitment to just one meal can be very significant. Give your new diet a six-week trial period. See how you like it, but more importantly, see how you feel. Well, I think first you have to make a commitment to wanting to eat well and um, spending a little time in the kitchen. And when you do that, I think you realize that food is best fresh. It's an evolution. You don't just go into this, you know, like hold your nose, jump off the deep end type thing. You do it little by little by little, but I think consciously you have to make the commitment, it's sort of like going on a diet. You make the commitment, yes, I'm going to lose weight. Yes, I'm going to eat better. Okay, well, the way to eat better is to eat fresh. The way to eat fresh is to eat local. So it kind of all boils down to that. And one of the great things about local and organic food is it's so simple. It's so beautiful all by itself. You really have to do very little to it. I think the first step is to go from processed food to start eating a squash. Uh, a winter squash baked and creamed and eaten, to go to eating steamed carrots, 
a spinach salad. I think we first need to go from processed food to fresh food. Once you've decided that eating local is what you want to do, you'll need a source of food. So let's start with your local grocery stores and restaurants. I think a lot of times city people, when they go to their grocery store, can ask the people where their food came from and how fresh it is. I think that's really important to have an understanding of, did it come from Chile? Did it come from Mexico? Did it come from California? And try to get something that is produced locally. And I know a lot of the, the big stores um, are getting into that a little bit more, but I think it's important if they know that that's what their customers want. If people um, can't produce or don't have a small piece of land to produce their own vegetables or some of their own food, they can participate in the uh, eating and purchasing locally, even at your grocery store. Uh, marketers have done uh, studies that say that if 10 people ask the produce manager at a grocery store for a certain item, they will bring it in because they know that if 10 people ask, there's 100 people that would purchase this product that don't ask. And I've participated in this and it does work. Local restaurants are also starting to purchase local in-season foods. If you eat at these restaurants, you're casting another vote. Your spending habits will encourage a bright future for your local food supply. If you're at a restaurant, say, hey, is there any local produce on this menu? Is anything on this menu actually bought from a local, a local farmer? So what if you have to choose between local and organic? Both are important, but eating local will have more impact than just eating organic. If I were to recommend what you need to do, you should buy local organic first. If you can't get that, buy local. That means you're getting some chemicals, but there's an eyes to acres relationship we talk about in agriculture. And if you can look your grower in the eye and he's conventional, he's using chemicals, you got an opportunity to educate him and ask him to not use that and to begin the transition into organic. So there's control, there's a, an opportunity. You know, Wendell Berry says, you know, you, you really can only, really can only affect where you are, where you have a chance to really do something. So you got to be local. You can have, po you can work on policy in DC and you can do these other things, but if you can talk to your neighbor who's doing, who's growing your food, you have an opportunity to help turn that ship. If you want to be closer to the farm where your food is grown, join a CSA or community supported agriculture group. You can show up to the farm and pick up your produce or even work in the fields. A share of the farm is a CSA, you know, share, which is a subscription, an annual subscription. They put it up front in January or February and they invest in that farm. Then they get a share each week when the produce starts coming or the fruit. The easiest way to get involved in, in this kind of movement is to, to join your local community supported agriculture and there's so many great websites um, to find them, um, you know, local harvest, and, and you just type community supported agriculture into a, a, a search engine and you're gonna come up with, with tons of them. Localharvest.org is a great website that you can go to and simply put in your address or your um, zip code and, and then it just tells you all these places that are available and for Katya's cousin, um, on the south side of Kansas City, there were 72 local farms available to purchase everything from pumpkins to, to cheap wool. No CSAs nearby? Shopping at a farmer's market or buying direct from a farmer are other paths to local food. Uh, there's more and more young people starting to go into farming. They know it's the right thing to do. But they're also finding the support because people are going out to them, they're buying from their ranch or farm stores or they're, or they're at, their, at their farmer's market stand in town. You do have to start gradually and it takes a while to develop uh, a relationship with a farmer, a relationship with your garden. It takes a, it takes a while to learn this and you'll, you'll find that, you, that you, you have different contacts. You'll say, well, this is where I get my milk. This is where I get my beef. You can do it at all sorts of different price levels, I guess, to, to match your income level. Uh, it just takes a little more labor on your part, probably, that you're going to have to get out there 
and drive out to the farm and get that 100 pounds of potatoes, but that'll be worth the trip. I mean, I mean, to drive out for five pounds of potatoes probably isn't worth it, but uh, find, find a supplier and go get a whole bunch of potatoes. I mean, get a bunch of friends together and uh, pick up their potatoes while you're there, you know, so that would be the way to do it. When you deal with local ingredients and organic ingredients and you're, and you're dealing directly with the farmer, you have to understand and you have to educate yourself on what is being produced at that specific time. Different foods grow with different seasons of the year. For example, when you eat locally, asparagus is only available in the spring, melons in the summer, and apples in the fall. Learn to create your menu around the seasons where you live, not the seasons on the other side of the globe. Is there unused and unsightly land in your neighborhood? Maybe it's time to start a community garden. If you've never gardened, this might be the perfect way to get started. They say it takes a village, and community gardens join people of all energy levels and expertise to create a wonderful neighborhood institution. So I, I think that the loss of community, of knowing your neighbors, is, is a real cultural loss. And I was so pleased at the idea of a community garden, much better than had I found someone who grew organic vegetables. So that immediately attracted me. And then I think that this whole movement of growing your own food and getting things that are pure and without insecticides and, and, uh, and that are grown locally, which is, of course, the way it was for generations, forever, until recent years when we started trucking everything in from flying. You know, you get string beans from Australia today in the market. And that all seems a little bit extravagant now. And, of course, with the crunch that we're in at this moment, uh, it's, it just seems particularly important that we, that we learn to sustain ourselves. And, uh, and if neighbors can grow the, the bulk of their garden, of their vegetables, their produce in this little garden, you know, how perfect. This is the best way to start. This is the absolute best way to start um, if, you, if you don't know very much about gardening because you've got all sorts of people around you. And what we found, and I don't know if it's just unique to our area or what, but what we found is that gardeners love to talk. Uh, and they just love to talk about their plants and what they've been successful at and what they haven't been successful at and what techniques they've used to, to develop their plants and get a good harvest. And um, so there's, there's many gardeners here. I, I would say the last in this last 16 people that we've added, probably a quarter of them are new gardeners who've never done any gardening at all. And um, one of the things that I, they've always asked, they do it every single time, is they ask, well, I don't know very much about this. Am I going to be successful? Am I going to get as much help as I need? And the answer's been 100% yes. We do a lot of exchanging. We do a lot of learning from one another. And um, then there's the benefit of the exercise, too. And then, I suppose, emotionally, there's a great benefit in Golly, it really worked. Or it really came up, those seeds uh, that I put in the ground. Look at them. And there's a, a tremendous satisfaction when you're successful. And it is amazing how everyone just shares everything. Everybody shares the tools. Everyone shares their supplies. Everybody shares the food. And so um, you don't have to plant everything you want because other people will plant things that you know that you'll be able to enjoy also. And we help each other. There's one person, one um, family had someone who was ill. And so the group of people who were at the meeting took care of their plot for them. If one person goes on vacation, somebody else will take care of the plot and make sure it's okay during that time. So we help each other. Well, most children today don't even know how things grow. They've never even seen a carrot come out of the ground or... And it's just the delight on their faces. And to see my children jump in here and run from the car and grab broccoli right off of the plant and go running around with it. And they love the people here and they love learning how to grow. And I have them help me and they're teaching, teaching them how to get into the earth and be part of nature. Because the way we live now in cities, people just aren't able to get that connection to the earth and nature anymore. And I just think it's real important for everybody. And I think that's why people love it so. It's a whole different side of people. You know, we're such a consumer culture and we just, 
take and take and take. And I think it benefits community because people slow down and realize they can work for themselves to pre produce things. And then also it's relaxing and enjoyable and beautiful. If you're interested in a community garden, go to communitygarden.org, type in your zip code, and find the community garden in your area you can join. If there isn't a garden in your area, you can find instructions on how to start one. Ultimately, growing food on your own, in your own way, makes a lot of sense. If saving money is a goal, this is where it can really happen. A typical family of four spends on average $970 per month on groceries alone. As you become proficient in growing and preserving your own food, your grocery bill can be significantly reduced. Well, you can always plant something, even if it's containers on your deck. And I've lived in a lot of places where that's all I could grow and or had small lots. Um, the house I lived outside of London had a small yard and yet there were always nooks and crannies of where to put lettuces and greens and um, we even put up a small glass greenhouse to grow tomatoes and melons and cucumbers and things like that. So I think no matter where you live you should be able to grow something. Today we're going to plant a container garden. We're going to grow lettuce. It's the easiest thing to grow. It's really a wonderful place to start if you've never gardened before because container gardens are super easy. Just need to know a few secrets. Uh, one of the first secrets is the soil to use. So this is a blend of potting soil and compost. You just pour it into your container. I like to use for lettuce, I like to use a container that's about four inches deep. You want to make the soil level to the top. Now we're just going to put three little divots in there for the seed. This can grow about three to six plants. A few lettuce seeds we got from the greenhouse. Just put a couple seeds in each spot. You can also get lettuce seeds at the hardware store, the garden store. Cover these up. I like to use uh, loose leaf lettuce. Once you get them planted, a little bit of water. Get them nice and wet. You're going to need to keep the soil wet for about seven days. In about 65 to 70 degrees, the lettuce will come on up and it'll be ready to pick in about 28 days. So these are lettuce seeds that have just come up. You can see the first true baby leaves. These are lettuce after about two weeks. You can see the first adult leaf coming on it. And then these are lettuces that are ready to pick. They're about 28 days old. And to keep lettuce coming week after week after week for your kitchen, you just need to plant a pot of lettuce about every two weeks. Um, lettuce is one of the easiest vegetable crops to grow, and it's one of the most nutrient-dense foods that you can feed your family. So another easy way to grow a garden is an earth garden. And the first thing you'll need is a few ingredients. Uh, you need to go get some straw. You can get that from a local feed store, a hardware store, or your local farmer. Uh, the next ingredient you need is some newspaper, and you can get that from the house, or you can go down to the recycle center. I'm sure they'd be happy to share. And then you're going to need a couple big bags of soil. You need some good potting soil and some compost and a little bit of organic fertilizer. So the first thing that we're going to do is to uh, find a flat area. You can build an earth garden right on top of your lawn. You can build an earth garden on top of a weed patch. We actually put ours on top of an old parking lot. So anything that has uh, regular soil under it, you can build onto. You do not need to take the weeds out. You do not need to take the grass out. You can just build right on top of it. So once you've found your area, then go ahead and lay out your bales around the outside perimeter. And then on the inside, you're gonna put the newspaper. And I put mine about a quarter inch thick and you want to be sure that you tuck some of the newspaper up under the bales so that the weeds don't encroach from the outside. Next, after your newspaper is in, you want to scatter the straw on the inside and you want to use enough bales of straw so that you fill up the entire uh, interior cavity with straw clear up to the outside bales. And that's it. You're ready to plant. This is our earth garden. It's made out of 100% biodegradable materials. We use three cases of newspaper, 20 bales of straw, 
It took us about 30 minutes to put it together, and now we're going to plant it. Okay, we're going to plant this beautiful tomato. First thing we're going to do is just dig a hole in the straw, clear down to the bottom. We're going to get a couple of scoops of our compost potting soil mix. It's just half compost and half potting soil. It goes in the bottom of the hole. Just spread that out with your hand. Put in a small scoop of your favorite organic fertilizer. Stir it in a little. Okay, and pot our tomato. It goes right in on the dirt. Some more potting soil and compost. Go all the way around the plant making sure that you cover up the entire root ball. We don't want any of those roots exposed to the air. Probably one more scoop here. Okay, smooth that in. Go ahead and give that a little drink of water. It's important to water your plants in really well. Water it there. Now put the straw back on top because that's going to conserve your water. We'll actually cut your water in half for this garden using all this straw mulch. Water it in again. Getting it really wet. And there you have it. Okay, next we're going to build a cinder block garden. These are wonderful gardens. They are semi-portable, a little more structural than the earth gardens. And the first thing you want to do is to find a piece of level ground. You can build on bare dirt, you can build it on top of cement, gravel, or even weeds. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to roll out a layer of weed barrier. This goes underneath the entire garden. After the weed barrier is rolled out, you're going to place the cinder blocks on the weed barrier and you're going to level your cinder blocks with some sand so that all the joints fit tightly. Now you can put a second layer of cinder blocks on top of the first layer if you want your beds to be a little bit higher. The cinder block gardens are filled with a special soil mix that's one third peat moss, one third sand, and one third compost blended together. So mix your soil. You're going to put the soil in the beds, rake it off level. You need to really soak it with the hose. You're going to water it oh, three or four or five times to get that peat moss to soak up the water. And you're ready to plant. Cinder block gardens are one of the easiest gardens to grow. They are one of the most productive garden methods around. They use one third less water, less time, and produce twice as much produce as a row garden. Is it difficult? Is it difficult? No, I would say it's a blast. <laughs> I would, um, there's nowhere I'd rather be than in this garden. I start things in my bedroom. I have a tower of lights in my bedroom. Um, I tell people all creation starts in my bedroom. And I start the little plants there. I move them outside when they get big enough and put them in the garden and I grow things year-round. My goal a few years ago that I made for myself was every day I would eat something fresh I grew myself. And I do that now. And it has taken a few years to be able to do that. We bought a greenhouse and it's an unheated greenhouse but I can grow winter lettuces and kales and chards and collards all year-round. When fruits and vegetables are very abundant in the late summer and early fall, it's a great time to buy some extra produce and preserve it for the winter. Locavores can make it through the winter when they eat from the reserves they put up in the summer. There are four methods to preserve fruits and vegetables for the winter. Canning, drying, freezing, and root cellaring. It takes some time, but it isn't hard. The work you do now will feed you and your family in the coldest months of the year. Ask around and find someone who preserves food 
and offer to help them to put up food. They'll be glad to get a helping hand and you'll get an education. The food that you preserve will be some of the best food you'll ever eat. For practical information on local food and economies, there are a number of organizations dedicated to the cause. Edible Communities Publications is an effective tool for connecting consumers with family farmers, growers, chefs, and food artisans of all types. These regional publications exist across the United States, Canada, and Europe. Go to www.ediblecommunities.com to find the closest magazine representing your area. Food Roots Network is a national nonprofit organization that provides communication tools, technical support, networking, and information resources to organizations nationwide that are working to rebuild local, community based food systems. FRN is dedicated to reintroducing Americans to their food, the seeds it grows from, the farmers who produce it, and the roots that carry it from the fields to their tables. Useful information and nationwide maps linking consumers to their nearest local food suppliers is at foodroots.org. For almost 25 years, Slow Food has been carrying out their mission of defending biodiversity in the food supply, spreading taste education, and connecting producers of excellent foods with co-producers through events and initiatives. With over 100,000 members worldwide, Slow Foods helps to foster the lost relationship between plate and planet bringing people closer to the origins of the food we eat. Getting society to switch to local foods will require enough people buying and eating local food that we have a paradigm shift. Not only do we have to participate, but we need to encourage our friends and neighbors to do it too. Share this information with everyone. Invite your family and friends over for a local dinner. Make a commitment to cook one local meal per month. Organize a canning and preserving party, plant a fruit tree, raise a few chickens. Who will carry the heavy things? Who will scrape? Who will pull? Who will pick up and who will dig? Who has the will? When some things will never show. Many will never know, many may never care for those who carry, those who lift, those who pack and look for space. For those who worry, those that love, those who have learned to wait, who will carry the heavy things? Many have no concern, but my heartfelt thanks to those who never ask, never question, always humble, just carry the heavy things. That's that. Well, I tell you people all I need 
there's a whole lot of luck, a whole lot of luck. And if you need me, you know where to look. I'll be laying in the shade by the babbling brook. Well, wake me up, pick a tune. Good Lord, it couldn't be too soon. Oh, pick a tune. Just holding you in my I'm arms satisfied. Just taking in all your I'm charms satisfied. Well, I tell you people all I need is a whole lot of luck A whole lot of luck and